Okay, welcome everyone on this morning talk about smart minimization in the Belgian public sector. My name is Christopher Slippe. I work at the research department of SMALS. SMALS is an ICT service provider for, indeed, the Belgian public sector. We offer know-how, staffing, development, infrastructure. We are, again, in 2024, top employer, and the good news for you is that we are hiring. Okay, physical masks. Physical masks are, I think, intriguing objects. They already exist for thousands of years. They are being used, they have been used for several reasons, such as just physical protection of the face for rituals, for theater, to even torture. But also, and that's interesting for us, to hide the identity of the person behind the mask. So, later with the advent of the writing, and definitely with the advent of the printing press, we saw a written version of the mask, of the physical mask, eh? the pseudonym. Pseudonym, that's a Greek word. It literally means fake name. And we all know examples of pseudonyms. Eh? Banksy, eh? that's the, uh, pseudonym behind, yeah, the pseudonym of a street artist. Eh? Satoshi Nakamoto, eh? the pseudonym of the inventor of Bitcoin. Eh? Later, with the advent of digitalization, we saw a more complicated version of the written pseudonym, which is the digital pseudonyms. It offers possibilities that in the past were not possible. Eh? So what we will do today, I would like to convince you that digital pseudonyms, they have a crucial role to play to protect the identity, the privacy, the personal data of citizens. Today I would like, like to talk about four types of, three types of smart pseudonymization invented by, smart, by small research. Three uh, systems for smart pseudonymization with a focus on identifier pseudonymization. That means converting so, uh, citizen identifiers, social security numbers, into unique codes. So let's start with the first one, format preserving pseudonymization. So most of you know, or all of you know, that before an application goes live, before it goes into production, it passes at least a test phase in a test environment, an acceptation phase in an acceptation environment, and then if everything goes fine over there, only then we go live, we go into production. And this cycle is repeated with each update of the application of the service. With format preserving synonymization, we will see that we can better protect personal data that is used in test and acceptation environments. Okay, let's go to the problem statement. It is unfortunately a fact that there is a widespread use of personal data in non-production environments. Eh? According to the World Quality Report of 2020, 60% of the organizations uh, admit that they use production data in test environments, which is a lot. This results in data breaches, unfortunately, data breaches from non-production environments, such as one in Uber, T-Mobile, and LastPass. So the risk is non-negligible. Also, if we use personal data in test and acceptation environments, we process personal data, which means the GDPR applies. The GDPR, GDPR applies, that means we need a legal basis. And only in very exceptional cases, the citizen will have given his, her, or their explicit consent. So that's not a legal basis that we can use. In the public sector, organizations can also use the legitimate interest, het gerechtvaardigd belang, of the organization as a legal basis. But I have talked to quite some DPOs in, in the public sector, and they tell me, look, that is a questionable legal ground, especially if we talk about uh, special, special, category, special categories of personal data, such as data about minors, such as medical data, such as data about sexual orientation and criminal data. So then the question is, what is the legal basis if we use personal data in test and acceptation environments? Also, if we process personal data, for instance, for test and development purposes, eh, we need to always have appropriate security measures in place. 
That's especially important in the test environment because the test environment is typically less secured than the production and the acceptation environment. Yeah? So we need to take additional measures. And if you read the GDPR, you will see a lot of references to pseudonymization. Yeah? Pseudonymization in general is encouraged by the GDPR. Some modules of the GDPR are relaxed if we apply proper pseudonymization. So in summary, pseudonymization could help us to become more compliant. So here you see an abstract, simplified overview of the reality in our sector, in the public sector. So we have several public sector organizations. They all have one or more application services that they are running. And each of these applications has at least a test acceptation and production environment. These applications, they communicate with each other. They exchange data, personal data often, also with external sources. This happens from the production environment, but also from acceptation environments, less from test environments. So there was this public sector organization, a customer of Smalls, who came to us with the question like, OK, how can we improve privacy in test and acceptation environments under this assumption that completely fictional data is not an option. Why is this not an option? Well, first of all, there, there are indeed these exchanges of personal data. If one application uses fictional data and asks extra information to another service about this fictional person, this application will not be able to reply, of course. A second reason is that the rules in the public sector and social security, they can become quite complicated. Eh? And if we make fictional data, if we create fictional data, we may, we, we may miss edge cases that do occur in reality. A third reason is that our data models become also quite complicated. So in summary, it will become very labor intensive. It will cost us a lot of money, a lot of taxpayers' money to create purely fictional data. So we came up with another solution. So let's start with the current practice of this public sector organization. It's quite straightforward. Eh? A snapshot is exported from the database in the production environment and imported into the acceptation or test environments. What we will do is, this, on the snapshot, we will do two relatively limited transformations, such that the privacy of the citizen improves a lot, but the data is still useful for, uh, test, and acceptation, uh, for test and acceptation environments. Here you see a fictional example of such a snapshot. It contains the structured identifier and the social security number, typically. The unstructured identifiers, first name, surname, and then also domain-specific data. What we will do is we will replace the structured identifiers, the social security numbers, by pseudonyms. With these pseudonyms, they have a very special property. They maintain the structure of the original social security number. And why is that so important? Because our legacy application can only handle strings that have the correct structure, that look like social security numbers. Then, with the first name and the surname, what do we do? That's a very simple operation. We shake a bit with the column. We do a shuffle operation. Or, more scientifically, we do a column-wise permutation. So, Casper, in our example, becomes Melchior. Melchior becomes Balthazar. And Balthazar becomes Casper. And we do something similar with the surname. The domain-specific data, that's something we leave untouched, because that is something that the application needs to do what it is supposed to do. What I also would like to mention, the shuffle operation, in the case of our customer, the application of our customer, can be one-directional, but it is important that the pseudonymized operation can also be inverted, and that we also can do the identify operation, which converts a pseudonym back into the original social security number. Why? That's something that we will see in a moment. So, what we do now, these three columns, they, these three green columns, they replace the original columns, and that way we have a transformed snapshot that is still useful for test and acceptation environments, while it's much harder to identify these records. So, our original flow changes into this flow. So, there is this transform tool that does these two operations, the shuffle and the pseudonymize. And what is also maybe important to mention is that the shuffle operation, that's something that our customer does locally in their transform tool, for the moment of POC. And the pseudonymize operation, that's logic that is outsourced to a pseudonymization service. 
This randomization service is at the moment an experimental service. It runs in the Labo of Small Research. So then a valid question, of course, why do we do this outsourcing of the pseudonymized operation? Well, first of all, it simplifies the logic at the side of the organization. It, it helps us to develop a generic service that can be used by many public sector organizations. And also, this way, we create a nice separation of duties. Separation of duties, that means that the entity managing the protected data and the entity managing the protection keys are two separate entities. So, as I told you, we also want to be able to communicate with the external world. An acceptation environment wants to be able to ask extra information about, about uh, certain persons, uh, uh, two services in the external world. Therefore, we add this pseudonymized operation. Uh, sorry, therefore, we add the, the proxy. So here we have a concrete example. There is this message. Eh? The acceptation environment wants to know if a certain citizen, that it only knows under pseudonym 22.51 and so on, if the citizen has the, has the right to a reduced co-payment, and for mended ramgeld in, in Dutch. This message is intercepted by this proxy. This proxy extracts from this message the pseudonym. It asks the pseudonymization service, OK, can you convert this back into the original identifier? And then this original identifier it replaces in the message the uh, original pseudonym. And that way, um, we have a message with the social security number. That's a message that the external world knows, that on which the external world, the external service can answer. So that's a bit of a high-level overview. Let's now have a look at our synonymization service. Eh? What we need to be able, we want that for a given environment, the synonymization service always converts an incoming identified into the same pseudonym and vice versa. We could do this, as suggested in this slide, with lookup tables. Eh? These lookup tables, they can become quite big, and they also they change all the time. So we have chosen for a more elegant approach. Instead of working with lookup tables, we work with cryptographic keys, which are much more compact. They are only 32 bytes long, and they stay constant over a longer period of time. And thanks to this approach, we can reduce, we can seriously re reduce the complexity of our pseudonymization service. And then, as already mentioned, thanks to the form of preserving character of our pseudonyms, legacy applications don't need to be modified in order to work with these pseudonyms. So now a remaining question is, how can we, with a simple cryptographic key of 32 bytes long, how can we convert a social security number into something that has the same structure, into a pseudonym that has the same structure as a social security number. What we see on this slide on the left is that traditional encryption won't help us as it destroys all structure. But there is this technology, relatively, not that young, but relatively young technology called phono preserving encryption. And it has this beautiful property that the output of the encrypt operation and the ciphertext maintains the structure of the input of the encryption, eh, the plain text. That's what we applied. So our forum preserving synonymization service receives identifiers, applies this encryption, and returns the pseudonym, the pseudonym which is, in fact, just a encryption. OK. This concept, we, build a proof of, we also build a proof of concept, an experimental service. An experimental service with a REST API. I will soon, in the next slide, show an example of uh, this REST interface. But our service offers basically two operations, a pseudonymized operation and an identifier operation. I think you understand how it works. A organization sends one or more identifiers to the pseudonymization service. It applies a pseudonymized operation, which results into one or more formal preserving pseudonyms, which are returned to the organization. And then the, the identify operation is the inverse. Here you see a concrete example. I think it's readable. At the left, you have the post request, post request which is sent to the synonymization service. At the right, you have the answer, the response generated by our synonymization service. So our post request contains 10 identifiers that need to be pseudonymized. Like the first one, 18.32 and so on, 
is converted into the pseudonym that you see in line 15 of the post response. So the pseudonym is 3043 and so on. Our post request also contains some malformed identifiers, such as the one in line 11. And then what we see is that our pseudonymization service can also deal with this in an elegant way. It says, look, this identifier, I couldn't pseudonymize it because it contains a checksum error. So what we have is we have a service that is easy to use, a quite straightforward REST API. It has graceful error handling, and it's also efficient. Why is it efficient? Because we only use symmetric encryption. Symmetric, symmetric encryption is always a lot more efficient than public key encryption. So our comp conclusion when you talk about forum-preserving synonymization, well, forum-preserving synonymization can play an important role to better protect data, personal data, and test and acceptation environment. But it's only a build, one of the building blocks. We need more. We have seen that our customer also needed to do this shuffle operation. For other applications, by other organizations, we may need something more, maybe, or something different. So it's only a partial solution. As a service, well, I already told you why we offer this as a service. It simplifies the logic at the side of the organization. It simulates reuse, and we can offer this service as a generic service, usable by many public sector organizations. And it also results in this nice separation of duties. This is still an experimental service, and at the moment we're in the phase that we are searching support to go live with this project, to go into project mode. So let's now go to our second smart synonymization technique, the e-health blind synonymization. So, oh, we have seen that form of tutoring synonymization can be used to improve the privacy in test and acceptation environments of legacy applications. But it would be better, of course, if we already think during the design of an application about how pseudonyms can be used to improve the privacy of the citizens. So that way, we can offer a higher level of security, not only in the test and acceptation environment, but also in production. And this is exactly what we have done with the blind pseudonymization service. It is designed and prototyped by Smalls, and it is live. So if you live in Belgium, there is a good probability that this service is used to protect data about you. So let's go to the problem statement. There are simpl simply many, too many data breaches in this world. Unfortunately, there is no silver bullet, but there are a number of principles that can guide us. One of these principles is privacy by design. And already during the design of an application, of a product, of whatever, we already think about privacy. Second principle is separation of duties. I already mentioned that one. So the entity managing the protection keys should not have access to the protected data, and vice versa. And then the last design principle is, I think, my favorite, simplicity. Simplicity, why? Because complexity is the worst enemy of security. Based on, these three, based on these three principles, we developed a highly secure solution that is already being used. So let's start with the use case, with the most important use case, referral prescriptions. Referral prescriptions, you all know this. It's a certificate issued by a doctor to start a treatment, for instance, to start physiotherapy. Such a certificate can give you the right, for instance, to have 10 physiotherapy sessions. Let's have a look at two simple use cases. For the moment, without security, through this, throughout this talk, we will add more and more security. So scenario one, the doctor wants to upload a new prescription to the prescription service. This pres prescription consists of an identifier, a citizen identifier, a social security number, eh? and on the other hand, a the prescription data, the actual prescription data. And these things are uploaded to the prescription service. The second scenario is quite similar. Our physiotherapist sends a citizen identifier to the prescription service. 
the description service looks up the corresponding prescription data and returns it to the physiotherapist. Okay, there are two important requirements, two important security requirements here. First of all, sonimization. We want to avoid that our prescription service can, ever li can link this prescription data to a citizen identifier to a citizen. The second important security requirement is partial encryption. So the prescription data consists of several fields. We want to be able to select a, se a number of these fields to, to encrypt some of these fields in such a way that our prescription service cannot decrypt this data. Let's start with the sonimization. So here we already have a quite simple flow to start with. So instead of sending the identifier to the prescription service, the doctor sends the identifier to a sonimization service, which converts the identifier, the social, sorry, social security number, into a um, pseudonym. And then the pseudonym is sent together with the prescription data to the prescription service. So here we already have something very nice, I think, in the sense that the prescription service no longer sees identifiers, it only sees pseudonyms. That's a good start, but if you look a bit more deeply, then you realize that maybe we have created a problem that's maybe even worse. Because the pseudonymization service, it sees all identifiers, it also sees all outgoing pseudonyms. It means that it can see when a prescription has been issued to you by which doctor. It can see when a prescription has been consulted by which physiotherapist. So this pseudonymization service can, in theory, compose a profile about each citizen in Belgium. That's something we don't want. So how can we avoid this? Well, we add two operations at the side of the doctor. A blind operation and an unblind operation. The blind operation, you can see this as a short-term encryption. The result of such a blind has the format of uh, some... Yeah, you can see it on top of the slide, what format it has. And this is sent to the synonymization service. The synonymization service can still convert this blinded pseudonym, uh, blinded identifier into a blinded pseudonym, and then it returns this blinded pseudonym to the doctor, and the doctor is the only one who can apply the unblind operation, which results in the pseudonym. And then the pseudonym is sent together with the prescription data to the prescription service. That's already very nice, because now we have a pseudonymization service which is blind. It no longer sees identifiers, it no longer sees pseudonyms. That's a huge improvement, but there is still an issue left, an issue that we also would like to tackle. You see that after the unblind operation, the doctor or the hacker of the doctor sees the pseudonym. So the doctor or the hacker of the doctor can compose a list with couples. couples that contain identifiers on the one hand and a pseudonym on the other hand. So imagine that the hacker has a lot of these links, a lot of these couples, eh? identifier, pseudonym couples, and he decides to publish this. Then it becomes trivial for an administrator of the prescription service to link prescription data to a citizen. That's also a risk that we want to avoid. So we add an extra layer of encryption here, the orange operations. So, the blinded pseudonym is encrypted by the pseudonymization service, and this encrypted blinded pseudonym is sent to the doctor. The doctor can only remove the blind layer, which results in an encrypted pseudonym. And this encrypted pseudonym can only be decrypted by the prescription service. And now, we have what we, wanna ha what we want to have. Each party only sees what it needs to see. The doctor, the healthcare professional, only sees citizen identifiers. The prescription service only sees pseudonyms. And the pseudonymization service sees neither. There is one small last thing that I would like to add, that we would like to add. Eh? Our pseudonymization service adds context before the encryption, such as a timestamp, and that way our prescription service is sure that the encryption that it receives, the encryption with the pseudonym, is fresh, is valid. Okay. So far, this was scenario one. Scenario two is very similar. A, a physiotherapist has an identifier. Identifier known by the physiotherapist is converted into 
a pseudonym known by the prescription service. Prescri prescription service looks up the prescription data and returns the result. So what we wanted to have is a generic service, a generic pseudonymization service. And of course, only offering a pseudonymized operation is not enough. It turns out that by adding an identify operation, which is the inverse, and by adding a convert operation, we have what we want to have. What is this convert? Well, many application services in the e-health ecosystem will use, will work with pseudonyms. And I am known under a different pseudonym in service A than service B. And sometimes, in order to let these services communicate with each other, which is important, as I have mentioned, it is necessary to convert pseudonym A into pseudonym B also in a secure way. So that is convert operation. And it turns out that by having these three operations, we can offer a very generic pseudonymization service that is already or will be used by many applications in the, in the e-health ecosystem. Another nice property that I think is that the physiotherapist or the healthcare professional in, in general can communicate, all, all communications happen directly with the, with the prescription service. And there are also other alternative solutions in which the pseudonymization service sits in between the physiotherapist and the prescription service. That, that's, that's just less elegant. What's more important is the complexity at the site of the healthcare professional. Why? Well, there are tens of thousands of healthcare professionals in these countries. There are dozens of software vendors, and all these software vendors, they need to integrate this blind and this unblind logic in their software that they sell to the healthcare professionals. Fortunately, it turns out that this blind and this unblind operation can be integrated quite easily. We meanwhile already have experience with this. Many software vendors have already done it. And a second nice thing, client side, is that client side, there is no key management necessary. Key management, that's always a bit cumbersome. No one likes to do it. And here we have a solution where the clients don't need to do this, which adds to the simplicity of our solution. So let's go back to our referral prescription. We talked about the requirement of pseudonymization. There's also the partial encryption requirement, which means that some fields of the prescription data should be encrypted such that the prescription service cannot access it. How do we do this? Well, the nice thing is we can just use, reuse the exact same flow that we have used for our pseudonymized operation. So here we see again the pseudonymized operation, pseudonymized flow. Identifier known by the doctor is converted into a pseudonym known by the prescription service. Let's assume that the doctor wants to encrypt this data that you see in the corner, in the upper corner. How can he do this or how can she do this? Well, first of all, a random key needs to be generated, a new fresh key. That's just a number of randomly generated bytes. With this key, it's easy now to encrypt the data, and the result, the encrypted data, is then forwarded, is sent to the prescription service. But of course, this key needs to be stored somehow in a secure way, such that also other authorized healthcare professionals can access, can read the content of the encrypted, of the encrypted data. So, this pseudonym that you see, that's in fact an encryption of the identifier. It's encrypted by the pseudonymization service. With the key, we can do exactly the same. So this key, known by the doctor, is converted into the pseudo key, an encryption of this key known by the prescription service. So the prescription service has no access to this key. So if you want to decrypt, how does that work? Well, here you see the identify flow, how, how a pseudonym known by the prescription service is converted into an identifier known by the doctor. The details of the flow, they don't matter that much. What is important is that the, to obtain the key, in order to give the doctor access to this decryption key, we follow the exact same flow. The pseudo key known by the prescription service is converted into, a, uh, into the original key known by the doctor. And now, decryption becomes trivial. So, we have something nice here, again. Only the authorized healthcare professional can have access to the key, can have access to the data. 
The prescription service and the pseudonymization service, they don't have access to the key, they don't have access to the data, and also there is basically no new logic required to implement this encryption and decryption functionality. We only need to do this decrypt and encrypt operation, we only need to generate uh, random keys, but these are all quite standardized, trivial operations. What is important, and what, do, what I would like to stress, is the following. The pseudonymization service is, of course, a crucial element of the security of the whole uh, system. So, it should be independent, it should be well secured, and it should have proper access control. So, so far, our referral prescription. There's also a second case, which is, at this moment, a proposal. It's not yet being used. So, most of you, if you live in Belgium, you will know Cienzano. It's a Belgian esteemed health research institute that played a very, very visible role during the COVID pandemic. And in order to do its work, it needs pseudonymized data originating from the hospitals, from several hospitals. So it can do research about COVID, it can do research about diabetes, and so on. It does not need to know the identifiers, so it only needs to know pseudonyms of the records that are being delivered. It needs to be able, with the pseudonyms, to combine, to join data about the same citizen originating from different hospitals. And this can again be done using the exact same flow that we have already seen. So, identifier known by the hospital is converted into a pseudonym known by Cienzano, and over the same channel also data about that citizen is sent to Cienzano. Hospital B does the same. And what is nice here is Hospital A and Hospital B, they give the same citizen identifier to the pseudonymization flow, which means it results into the same pseudonym known by Cienzano, and this allows Cienzano to link the data originating from the two different hospitals about the same citizen to each other. We maintain the advantages that I have already talked about, but there is an additional advantage. So, so um, prescriptions, they are mainly issued and consulted during the day, during business hours, which means during the night, our pseudonymization service has a lot of available resources, a lot of capacity that is unused. And in contrast to these prescriptions, join and pseudonymize projects are not time critical. So we can just schedule this during the night, and that way we, come, we have a more optimal use of our existing infrastructure. So our conclusion, I think that the blind pseudonymization service of eHealth, it's a nice example of privacy by design in a public sector that is already being used today. It's also a nice example of separation of duties in the sense that the prescription service and the pseudonymization service are two distinct, two separate entities. I think it's also a nice example of simplicity because encryption and decryption happen in the same way as with the same flows as pseudonymization and identification. Also, the client side uh, it remains relatively simple. It's live and it knows uptake. So it is used or it will soon be used to protect all kinds of medical data. I talk about prescription data, about, I talk about vaccination data, about fertility data, fertility data and so on. Okay, so far the eHealth blind pseudonymization service. We have seen that it can do simple ways of join and pseudonymize operations. But sometimes we need something more powerful, and that's why we developed, why we invented Oblivious Join. So, let's go to the problem statement. Regularly, researchers, typically from academia, they come to us with the need to answer very specific research questions. On this slide, you see such a real-world research question. Eh? Do multiple sclerosis patients who take medications with certain molecules, do they have an increased cancer risk compared to multiple sclerosis patients treated with other medication? That's a very valid question with added value for society. In order to answer this question, we need to join, to combine data or originating from two different sources, from the IMA, the Intermutualist Agency, and from the BCR, the Belgian Cancer Registry. 
For the IMA, it's easy. It knows who has multiple sclerosis, and it delivers the required data, the medication data, about all people with multiple sclerosis. For the BCR, the Belgian Cancer Registry, it's a bit more complicated. It should not learn who has multiple sclerosis, because multiple sclerosis, that's sensitive medical personal data. The BCR should not know this. At the same time, the BCR only wants to deliver data to this collector. I will talk later about this collector. It only wants to deliver the minimal amount of records to our collector. Why? Because cancer data is medical data. So the paradox is this. The question is this. How can the BCR, the Belgian Cancer Registry, deliver only records about people with multiple sclerosis without learning who has multiple sclerosis? So that's not a trivial question. How do we solve these kind of questions today? Well, each time we have this kind of question, we make this kind of complex research flow sorry, flow that you see on the, on, on the right. And this is made manually. So it's a lot of bespoke work, which makes it slow. I talked to a lot of people in the field, and one person told me, look, it takes weeks, months, sometimes even years before we can access the data. So that's indeed quite slow. Also, these manual procedures are expensive. Someone else in the field told me, look, it requires an exorbitant amount of resources to answer these kind of research questions. And also, this kind of manual work, these this flows, they are error prone. So in this concrete example, the list of all citizens with multiple sclerosis would have leaked to the Belgian Cancer Registry. Fortunately, this has been, just on time, been detected, and then we came up with a kind of dirty solution, if I may say this, a solution that is not very easily to it's only not very practical. We cannot generalize it. So we see that there is room for improvement here. And a valid question, of course, is how do other countries do this? Well, what we see is that countries they typically rely on a combination of heavily trusted parties combined with strong legal regulations. But we are technical people, and we are aware, we know, that an elegant, privacy by design, technical solution would be much better. So here's a challenge. We want to join and pseudonymize personal data originating from different sources under one specific constraint. So not all data sources are independently, autonomously able to select only the relevant records. Let's go back to the Belgian Cancer Registry. It's unable to select records only about citizens with multiple sclerosis. There are also a few requirements. It should be privacy friendly, so the involved entities should only learn what they have to learn, which means that the data sources delivering data should not obtain new data, should not learn new personal data. It should be uniform, so each research question is different, with different data sources involved with different da uh, data also involved. Nevertheless, we want that this join and pseudonymized process should always happen, and it always happens in the same uniform way, in such a way that we can avoid all this manual work. No data aggregation, it turns out, after talking to these researchers, that in general, they need access to the individual pseudonymized records. We cannot give them aggregated uh, data. And that's a no-brainer the solution should be easy to use. So in our initial research question, the researcher wanted data about all citizens with multiple sclerosis, which is the green area in our Venn diagram. For the rest of our talk, we'll simplify this research question a little bit. And from now on, our researcher is only interested in data about citizens who have multiple sclerosis and cancer. So the researchers is only interested in the intersection. And from there, we can expand, extend our solution. So let me explain a concept in a few words on a high level. We have here our two data sources, the Intermutualist Agency and the Belgian Cancer Registry. 
depending on the research question, multiple, yeah, two, three, more, five um, data sources can be involved. Let's just assume that we want to answer a research question in which three data sources are involved, the IMA, the Belgian Cancer Registry, and also the Federal Public Service Health. Now we will execute a protocol. A protocol that, is, consists, that consists of three steps. In the first step, our three data sources, they will communicate with each other. They will keep a crypto talk in which random numbers or numbers that cannot be distinguished from randomly generated numbers are exchanged. In this process, no personal or statistical data leaks. Then in the second step, once this is done, each data source can autonomously send in a specially encrypted way the data to the collector that from their perspective, from the perspective of the data source, may be relevant to answer the research question. So if you go back to the BCR, the Basel Cancer Registry, it would deliver in an encrypted way data about all citizens with cancer. And of course, that way our collector receives way too many way too many encrypted data, but fortunately, thanks to the agreements that, uh, made in step one, we can mathematically, formally prove that the collector can only decrypt this data that is in the intersection. And the collector can only decrypt the data that is relevant to answer the research question. So, in this process, the data sources do not learn any new personal or statistical data, and they only see identifiers. Our collector, it learns only the minimal required pseudonymized personal data. It, le it learns also, on top of that, some high-level statistical data, but in practice that doesn't matter. And it only sees pseudonyms, it doesn't see identifiers. The solution is nice in the sense that even if multiple data sources collude, they cannot derive new data. On the other hand, we should ensure that the collector does not collude with data sources, because then the security of our solution is compromised. So this collector, it's a kind of independent and semi-trusted entity, and it can do some things. It has some responsibilities. So first of all, it should remove all the ciphertext that it cannot decrypt, just in case. Secondly, what we typically do in our sector is a small cell risk analysis. So the data that can be joined together and that can be decrypted. It contains indivi individual records. And although we replaced identifiers by pseudonyms, the record can still contain other data that can result in a kind of identification risk. So this is, this is one of the operations that our collector should do, and reduce this identification risk of indiv individual records. But despite this, it will rarely be zero. So there's still a kind of residual uh, identification risk. That's why the collector will never send the raw data to the researcher. Instead, the collector is responsible to give, in a controlled way, the researcher access to this pseudonymized and joint data. So, let's have a look at how we use this in practice. Each of the four participants need to download the client that's an executable, that's a JAR file. Then for each research question, a JSON file is composed, is created, and this JSON file contains all the data that is necessary to execute the protocol. This JSON file is by all four participants given to the client, and then aside from this also, the data sources give a CSV file to the client. This CSV file contains all the identified personal data that may be relevant to answer the research question, that may be relevant from the perspective of this data source. So again, in the case of the Belgian Cancer Registry, it's the CSV file contains the ident identified information about all citizens with cancer. The protocol is executed, and then the only output of the protocol is this black CSV file at the side of the collector, which contains only the minimal required joint and pseudonymized personal data. So that's on a high level how it can be used. Here you see a test data that I used to run a test. We have our three input CSV files. The first one contains 200,000 records, the second one 500,000, and the third one contains 1 million records. 
Our researcher is only interested in data about citizens in the intersection, which contains 50,000 citizens. So now you see on the bottom of this slide, you see the output file generated by the client at the side of the collector. It contains these 5,000 records, 50,000 records in the intersection. You can see that it no longer contains identifiers, it contains pseudonyms. And you can also see that data about the same citizen, originating from the three different uh, CSV files, uh, is joined together here. So we have citizen 60.01.05 and so on. It has a record in each of the three input CSV files, therefore it also has a record in our uh, output CSV file, with all the data combined. Okay, a little word about the efficiency. Um, running this test took a few minutes of computations, less than two minutes, which is quite fast, and a few hundred megabytes of data were exchanged, which makes it quite efficient for a distributed protocol. Okay, the conclusion. So what I would like to add before jumping to the actual conclusion is that this work is quite theoretical. It's, um, but we, fortunately, we collaborate with universities. So in the next week, or the next month, our first paper will be published. It's an interdisciplinary paper. It will be pub published by Springer Nature. Aside from this, we are also working in collaboration with university on an expert paper an expert paper which mathematically proves the claims that I have done in this talk. I cannot uh, give a lot of detail about this because the paper has not yet been published. It's almost finished. We, want, we soon want to submit it and then hopefully it will be accepted after peer review. So this is the conclusion of Oblivious Join. So it is a practical solution for a real business need. It's privacy friendly, it is secure, it's fast, it's cost efficient, we have a uniform approach to do all this, to answer all these re research questions, and also we have a formal academic validation, which makes it a quite strong solution. Unfortunately, we are confronted with a few challenges, challenges to bring this live. We have seen in the field, of the, in the public sector, a lot of interest, but so far, unfortunately, only passive interest. That's why this project is still in research phase. Also, if you run this kind of distributed protocols, the logic in the client is higher. So we have a higher development complexity to develop the clients. We focused on the intersection of these Venn diagrams, but in reality, we need something more. And that's also logic that still needs to be added. Despite these challenges, I think that the solution offers opportunities. Opportunities to unlock, da unlock data faster, cheaper, and more securely, which, if, which, gives us a, which could give us, us a qualitative benefit in the sense that we will be able to answer more complex scientific research questions. It would also give us a quantitative benefit in the sense that it, we will be able to handle more research questions. And then this could lead to improved policy making, improved healthcare, improved competitiveness, and so on. So let's wrap up. We have seen three techniques for smart identifier pseudonymization. And I hope that by now you are convinced that smart pseudonymization, that pseudonyms, they play a crucial role to protect, to protect your personal data. So, Thank you, for your, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, you can come here to me. I will also be at the Smalls booth, uh, booth number six. If you want to read more about this talk, about the content of this talk, you can scan this QR code. You will find a few articles in Dutch and French over there. So thanks again for your attention. <laughs>